Hello, so um, our next section is going to be dealing with eating disorders. So the prevalence in the U.S. among adolescents, um, this survey was done by Swanson a few years ago, surveying over 10,000 adolescents 13 to 18 years of age. Um, and in this survey, the prevalence for anorexia nervosa was 0.3%, for bulimia nervosa, 0.8%, and binge eating, 1.6%. Uh, this study was using the old DSM-4R criteria rather than the DSM-5. Uh, so the prevalence rate might be just a little bit different. Um, in other community surveys, they um, reported the prevalence of disordered eating in 14 to 22 percent. Um, Grace incidence, that is new cases, uh, is in the mid to late teens. A paper by Favaro uh, about a decade ago suggested that the mean age of the onset of eating disorders has been decreasing and uh, what he reported was a significant decrease in the couple of decades between 85 and 2008. Let's go over the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for anorexia. Uh, in italics are the DSM-5 differences over what the DSM-4R um, diagnostic criteria had been. Uh, restriction of energy intake relative to requirements leading to a significantly low body weight. And again, greater than 50% below the ideal body weight. An intense fear of gaining weight, becoming fat, or persistent behaviors that interfere with weight gain. A disturbance in one's body weight or shape, how it's experienced, the undue influence of weight or shape on self-evaluation, and the persistent lack of recognition of the seriousness of the current low body weight. Um, so I have some friends who are power lifters um, and they actually fit several of these criteria for anorexia nervosa, uh, interestingly, um, because they, if they don't have a good workout, and these guys go through mad regimens in order to make weight for uh, their shows, um, they easily fit at those times getting ready for the shows, the criteria for anorexia nervosa. So you're thinking mostly about this 15-year-old, really, really thin young woman, but you know the guy with a chest size of 50 and biceps about 20 inches might still have uh, meet the criteria. You should specify if it's restricting or if it's a binge eating purge type. Bulimia nervosa. Recurrent episodes of binge eating. So these are eating in a discrete time period, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat, and a sense of a lack of control over eating during these episodes. Afterwards, they, uh, they uh, engage in inappropriate compensatory behavior to try to prevent weight gain. This includes inducing emesis, the use of laxatives, or subsequently fasting. Binge eating compensatory behaviors occur on average at least once a week for three months. In italics, again, is the new DSM-5 criteria. Um, Self-evaluation is unduly influenced by shape or weight. And the reason I went through anorexia before discussing bulimia nervosa is that the disturbance does not occur exclusively during anorexia nervosa. One of the new kids on the block, ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. This is eating or feeding disturbances which include a lack of interest in food or food avoidance on the basis of sensory characteristics or aversive to the consequences of eating with a failure to meet appropriate energy needs. They also need to meet uh, these criteria, a significant weight loss or growth failure, significant nutritional deficiencies, a dependence on enteral or oral supplements, somebody who's got a G-tube in in order to get an adequate nutrition so they're not diagnosed with uh, another type of eating disorder, and interference with psychosocial functioning. The disturbance is not explained by a lack of available food and doesn't, exclude ex doesn't occur ex exclusively during anorexia or bulimia nervosa. Again, that's why those two diagnoses went on before ARFID and there's no evidence of a body image distortion. And this cannot be attributed to a concurrent medical condition or another mental disorder. For example, 
kids who have untreated Crohn's disease when they get the diagnosis. They don't have ARFID. If they are worried about the food coming down in their esophagus because they've got Crohn's disease, again, does not apply to ARFID. Binge eating disorder. These are recurrent episodes of binge eating. Uh, this is not dissimilar to a diagnosis a couple slides ago. Uh, eating a discrete time period, amount of food definitely larger than most would eat, and a sense of lack of control. The binge eating episodes are associated with three of the following five criteria. Eating more rapidly than usual. This excludes if you're a house officer. Eating until you're feeling uncomfortably full. Eating a large amount when you're not feeling hungry. I'm sorry, I have to include some humor in here, right? Eating alone because you're feeling embarrassed about how much you're eating or feeling disgusted with yourself, depressed and guilty when you're uh, after a binge eating episode. Uh, marked distress regarding the binge eating is present, occurs at least once a week for three months, and it's not associated with compensatory behaviors during anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, or ARFID. So there is a method to my madness. That's why we discuss anorexia first, bulimia nervosa second, ARFID third, and binge eating disorder fourth. So though a couple years ago uh, went through 651 adolescent patients who had been diagnosed with an eating disorder and compared the old criteria DSM-4R with the new criteria DSM-5 um, to try to find the different diagnoses. So in um, using the 4R criteria, you can see that um, there were almost half the patients who qualified as an eating disorder by the old DSM-4R criteria, almost half were eating disorder not otherwise specified. And uh, with the new DSM-5 diagnoses, you can see that um, anorexia, atypical anorexia, almost doubles, bulimia nervosa is about the same, binge eating comes up with 1.2, and ARFID comes up with 1.7%. Now these are people who had a previously diagnosed eating disorder, and I'm guessing that if you take a look sort of at the prevalence of the different eating disorders, you would find a little bit more of ARFID now than you would have using the, you know, again, all these patients had been diagnosed with DSM-4 criteria earlier. So when we're looking at predisposing factors for eating disorders, there are several different classic factors, body satisfaction, weight preoccupation, disordered eating. Um, we've also uh, uncovered genetic uh, factors, but interestingly, it appears that it's interacting with pubertal maturation. There appears to be little genetic influence prior to puberty, but afterwards, um, there is a significant genetic pubertal interaction and Klump uh, suggests that this may be partially mediated through sex steroid action on the brain, specifically estrogen on the brain. Uh, Gene-wide uh, analysis uh, demonstrated 13 different genetic variants associated with eating disorders, and interestingly, a lot of those were associated with neurodevelopment, especially around dysregulation of 5-hydrotryptophan. And again, I have to put some humor, but you know, it's so interesting that, uh, and this is very uh, gender stereotypic, uh, but it, it does appear that when men look in the mirror, they see something very different than when women look in the mirror. The women often will emphasize parts of their anatomy they're not as happy with, and the men, of course, all look like Adonis when they look in the mirror. It's amazing, we all look like Adonis or Hercules. It's great. Okay, so uh, Kay was the one who um, then came up with, after suggesting some of these um, findings with 5-HT metabolism, that um, tried to suggest a unifying concept for anorexia nervosa. Uh, in part, it's dependent upon cultural and social pressures. I mean, you op open up any common magazine, and you look at the ads, and typically what you're gonna see in those ads is almost the identical thing. You're going to see a young woman who has a BMI of like 16. Victoria's Secret, the average BMI is somewhere between 15 and 16. Okay, most of you know me, you've seen me around in firms, 
and you look at me and you say, that guy is thin. Well, my BMI is 21, so if you took away about one third of my body, you would find a Victoria's Secret supermodel hiding inside. So, just some things about culture and social pressures in the ideal beauty. So, uh, Kay again had reported a couple years before he made this unifying concept of 5 HC dysregulation. Um, and it's, I think, a brilliant idea because reducing nutritional intake leads to a further decrease in tryptophan le uh, levels. Um, the malnutrition leads to alterations in the neuropeptides and the dysphoria. So initially the fasting works a little bit because there's a slight decrease in tryptophan so the dysphoria improves a little bit. But the malnutrition leads to these secondary changes in the neuropeptides and leads to more profound dysphoria. So again, it's a slippery slope that they start getting into. Um, and that um, the reason that maybe this happens during puberty is because of the impact of uh, the estradiol receptors in the brain and an interaction between the 5-HT and the, um, the receptors. Since this proposal, had been offered. Uh, there have been several different studies with functional MRIs and PET scans as well as, I'm not sure how they did this study, CSF levels of the neuropeptides that all help um, confirm this hypothesis. So, you know, part of this gets into as a primary care provider or as a subspecialist in several different subspecialties, the patient presenting with potentially amenorrhea, or with dry skin, um, or with abdominal pain, um, or even with kidney stones. So it could, this could be presenting to a subspecialist, but to a primary care provider, they see that you know, the person's weight and BMI are going down at a time that weight and BMI normally increase. Um, so the medical complications, which sort of will lead subsequently into the criteria for hospitalization, medical complications include hypothermia, bradycardia, hypotension, myocardial atrophy, heart muscle, you know, the heart will sort of give it up in order to try to feed the brain, uh, prolonged QT. There is both an impaired ability to concentrate the urine as well as to uh, excrete free water. So the urine that they're putting out is slightly concentrated, not as concentrated as it maybe should be, um, but the kidney has lost both its concentrating and diluting effects and renal calculi. Gastrointestinal include gastroparesis, constipation, and the superior mesenteric artery syndrome, the SMA syndrome. Uh, endocrine complications include amenorrhea, osteoporosis, and almost all of them develop a sick euthyroid syndrome. The criteria for hospitalization is a heart rate under 50 during the daytime or less than 45 at night, Orthostatic changes including heart rate of greater than 20 beats per minute or blood pressure change greater than 10 millimeters. Uh, systolic pressure less than 90, oral temperature of less than 35.6, hypokalemia, hypochloremia, weight under 75% of ideal body weight or weight loss despite intensive outpatient management. Acute food, re food refusal, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias, prolonged QTC, of course a failure of outpatient management. Um, the others, the second leading cause of death in patient with anorexia is suicide. In fact, of all the DSM-5 psychiatric diagnoses, uh, anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate. Uh, and again, it's because of suicide. Other issues, syncope, hematemesis, esophageal tears. Some of you had the opportunity to take care of that patient that we admitted uh, earlier this year with a BMI of 10.8. Uh, if you'll recall, overnight her heart rate was in the 30s. Um, she was not orthostatic when she arrived. She only became orthostatic after she'd been in the hospital for four or five days. Her systolic pressure was in the 80s. Her oral temp was well below 96 degrees. 
Um, and she developed the refeeding syndrome. In fact, we gave her 750 calories the first day and she developed the refeeding syndrome on 750 calories. So who are the groups at re risk for refeeding syndrome? Anorexia, chronic malnutrition of whatever etiology, whether it's cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, alcoholism, or a hunger strike. If the body weight is below 75% of the ideal, they're at risk. And at a BMI of 10.8, she was, I think, 50% below ideal body weight. Um, and I put there, typically within two weeks of refeeding, how about overnight? Um, and actually, in most of our patients with anorexia, they do develop refeeding syndrome within the, uh, the first couple or three days. The associated abnormalities include hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, fluid retention, pitting edema, and thiamine deficiency. The most common that we typically see are hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, and fluid retention in that order. Uh, management. And this is really important like in the emergency room because they come in and they're orthostatic and you know, typically your first impulse is to give them a normal saline bolus. But remember, their heart already, the muscle's been metabolized, there's a decreased ejection fraction, uh, the kidneys can't really concentrate anything, so you have to be, you know, we, if we can, we try to avoid IV fluids because it can get us into uh, a little bit of right or left sided failure. So judicious administration of fluids, we start at 1250 to 1500 calories a day, advance to 250 calories daily. Uh, we put them on multivitamins and zinc. We do daily weights, I's and O's, and we give them a daily renal panel for the first week that they're there. Outpatient management, um, so about 25 to 30 percent of patients, the first time they present for outpatient management, we admit to the hospital because um, they meet the criteria for hospitalization at that time. The vast majority, however, we manage as outpatients, and many of them never get ho hospitalized. Uh, it is a team approach, it's a multidisciplinary approach, um, and we use family based therapy, FBT. Uh, some people know it as the Maudsley approach or the Locke Lagrange approach or sy systemic family therapy. Uh, it's three phases. The coaching caregivers refeed the patient, their specific interventions, uh, and when appropriate, uh, transfer control of eating to the patient, and we're trying to prevent relapse. Like with most chronic diseases, the better that you can get on top of it in the beginning, the better the outcome. So we do try to do full court press, especially early on. It leads to better long, acute and long-term outcomes. 50, 60% remit within a year, and uh, 25 to 35% with partial recovery. Unfortunately, you add those numbers up and there are a group that go on to having a very chronic disorder. For further reading, I'm going to recommend these two texts. Um, Nutritional Rehabilitation, Practical Guidelines for Refeeding the Anorectic Patient by Mailer, and uh, Update on the Medical Management of Eating Disorders in Adolescents by Golden et al. Thank you so much.